And I'm back once again. Part four, I believe. You guys didn't really miss anything. Free rolling on the day, I'm up about $500 which is nice whether I lose all this right now or not um, kinda of feels weird to have cashed for two thousand dollars plus a couple other main caches and only be up five hundred but I've been playing a lot more volume and a lot of big buy-in tournaments recently so it's not something big because if I don't I could be losing a lot of money in a single day so but now I'm free rolling which is nice, uh, and I'm already up, so, so nice. This guy right here, Troy, played with him all the time on, uh, Throw Dog, and, uh, there's the same name over here, and I've looked him up on Pocket Fives, it's definitely the same guy. Blazer symbol on both of his, uh, profiles. You know, I've been playing with this guy for years. Um, I don't know who's gotten the best of who. I think I've gotten a little bit the best of him. I've actually met him in real life. He's from Oregon, obviously. He's got the Blazer thing. I met him at a live tournament um, close to where I live. Well, kind of close to where I live. And uh, just got to go with this. And I got the best hand. And that's one so far. But anyways, uh, so I, uh, yeah, I mean, we're probably pretty even against each other. I, I remember I beat him heads up one time in a pretty significant tournament. Um, I didn't necessarily outplay him or anything, but I did beat him. Um, I feel like I got a decent handle on how he plays and approaches the game, which is nice. Uh, one of the few guys who I play with all the time who I feel like I really, you know, got a got a decent handle on his approach and um, doesn't mean I can destroy him or dominate him or anything but I feel like I can uh, I want to three bet this guy again oh man not this time though maybe I will if he raises again but after a three betting once and having it not work it makes me not want to do it again just because he's already seen me fold the three bet once, or four bet once, um, making it more likely to fold the four bet a little lighter, and also, you know, he showed he was a little bit more willing to step up than I would have liked. So he probably just woke up with a big hand that time and probably isn't thinking about me three betting him again, light. So it might have not been a bad spot to do it, but I just like it. Back to us, I'm with Troy just. He's one of the only players I feel like I've started to figure out his whole approach to the game. I'm not very good at doing that with regulars. Um, you know, a lot of the guys on on uh, Locke or Bodog I've played against with for for a really long time, and I've played with them thousands of hands, and I know they're good players, and I, I kind of know what they're capable of, but at the same time I don't know the intricacies of their uh, their philosophy on the game or how they play certain spots and you know those intricacies I, I feel like I don't know very well with most players and Troy for whatever reason I feel like I just I got that figured out the best against him out of everybody so that's, that's one of the parts of my game I can really improve is figuring out best some of the regulars um, I don't study hand history super in depth uh, in my off time with, with guys I play against all the time. I don't, um, a lot of times I play a lot of tables. I don't make very good notes. So, so there's a lot of weaknesses in my game of figuring out tendencies and exact things about how certain players play. And some of the best players are really good because they can take advantage of some of the guys that you see over and over and over again. So, 
to take my game to another level, that's the kind of stuff I'm going to have to start doing, is just really figure out tendency with certain players. I feel like this is pretty standard, having a nice small blind, having the amount of chips I have compared to the blinds, and just got to take it, trying to take it down, you know. Not wanting to extend the hand, probably I have the best hand. You know, if he has a better hand, he has a better hand, and it's just hard for me to get a better hand. And also, if he's calling with a7, he's calling with a5, you know. So I'm either getting him the full hands that have me beat, or he's still going to be calling with hands that are that are worse than mine. So. Even if I do get called, I'm not done, you know. It's there's something a lot of players especially a lot of beginners and a lot of you know newer players, maybe not exactly beginners, but newer players, they just they see themselves getting their hand in behind as being the bad play when even if you got your, your hand in bad, it's not necessarily the, the wrong play, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't have made the play, and it doesn't mean it doesn't mean you weren't ahead of his range, you know? It doesn't mean he would have called you with a lot of hands that you would have beaten, and, you know, if, you ha if you're in a 60-40 spot, it's like, it's not what you want, but if you had some fold equity on top of that, you gotta take it, you know? Depending on obviously how many chips you're throwing in the middle, but I know I had it took me a long time to figure out a lot of those concepts that I just discussed. And you know, I was definitely a winning player for a long time before I figured out some of those concepts, so I uh, just thinking about how much I've improved over the years just makes me feel like, wow, I was a winning player, yet I was so rudimentary in my game. And part of that is just because poker has evolved over the last couple of years, but when I really started taking poker seriously, my game has still just evolved a ton. I'm going to look at myself. Um, he's not that aggressive of a player. If he's really aggressive, I, I just matched up the stats, and I gave you guys can't see my stats. I don't know why my uh, poker tracker doesn't show up on these recordings but I have stats next to all the players and it never matches me up so I have to move myself around so it matches me up with everybody and they're very helpful I don't have them it doesn't work for me on Bodog but it works for me on Mock so that's nice and I definitely use them a lot especially I only actually use four stats I use a VP, which is voluntary, voluntarily put money into the pot, basically, every time they've put money into the pot that wasn't a forced bet. I use preflop raise percentage, so I can see how often they're raising. I have three bet percentage, so I can see how often they're betting. I have fold to three bet percentage, so I can see how often they fold three bets. All of those stats have been very useful. Um, one of the big stats that's useful is seeing how often they put money in the pot compared to how often they raise, and if the numbers are close, it means they never limp. If they are far apart, like they put money in the pot 30% of the time, but they only raise 10% of the time, it means they limp a lot or they call a lot. And, you know, if that player limps in an early position, you don't have to be afraid of it. You can just go keep limping with garbage, like always, like this guy just did. Um, but if you know, if they, like my stat right here is I put money into the pot 9% of hands and I raise, I guess it just changed, but it says I voluntarily put money into the pot 10% of hands this tournament and I've raised preflop 9% of hands. So I'm not limping and I'm not flatting very often. Um, and, and those are good stats to know about people if you know they flat very often or if they uh always raise or you know stuff like that it, it, it's it's very helpful information um this guy limps a lot he limps for, he puts money to the pot 48 percent of the time and raises only 10 percent of the time so i'm guessing his hand's pretty weak there's a thousand chips out there i can 
gather them all probably if I shove, and I'm protected against a lot, so I'm gonna shove. I feel like that's the best play by far. The only other thing I could think about doing was making a solid raise, which it just has a chance to extend the pot, which I don't really want to do. I want to just take down the thousand ships. Um, I could limp and try to hit something, but it leaves me open to a re-raise behind, and I'm if I hit it, I'm in a mixed up pot with three other players most likely, and it's just, you know, I have no guarantee of hitting, so I just like taking down the thousand chips when I'm pretty certain I can. I just, I'm risking 6,000, and I, I'm not good at quick mental math, but, you know, it, don't, it has to work so many times for me to be making money by getting that thousand chips. Then even if I do get called, I'm not losing all 6,000 because I have a percentage chance to win, and some of the time I'll be 50-50, some of the time I'll be 60-40, some of the time I'll be, you know... 5% chance if someone has kings or something or aces, but it's just, you gotta put all those odds together and make a play that makes the most sense and right there, picking up the thousand chips most of the time made the most sense for advanced players it's a pretty basic concept, for beginning players or intermediate players it can be oh, take you a while to really grasp exactly what it means and, and how to apply it, um, and how it exactly works, and you can never get exact because you know, the exact odds of what people are going to call with, it's really hard. So you have to make pretty quick, basic estimates and do the best you can with it. Um, I'm just going to start a new video for the, after the break just because, frankly, I only have a minute or two left and there's no reason to come after break with only a minute or two left. So I'll start a new video after the break. Um, I believe, I don't know what part we're on anymore, but I'll see you guys then.